These are so called SMPS, which means Switch Mode Power Supply. This is one of the most commonly used supply with a relatively high efficiency. An SMPS transfers power usually from AC to DC and converts voltage and current characteristics as needed for a specific project. The opposite type of supplies are those who are using linear regulators and transformers. These are not efficient at all and also could be very big and weigh too much. As you can see here, this is a 10 watt switch power supply and it only weighs 50 grams. Now this here is a 30 watt switch power supply and weighs around 100 grams. But now this one here is just 18 watts linear power supply and it already weighs around 4 times more than the other supplies. And also another compare, this is the PCB of a 360 watt supply of 24 volts and weighs just below 400 grams. But now we have just the transformer of a 15 watts linear power supply of 12 volts and it already weighs double the weight but is for 7 times less power. The costs are also higher due to more material needed to fabricate for the metal and the copper wire. And also for higher loads, we need a lot more copper wire and also a lot thicker. But as you can see, the circuit is a lot more complex for the switch supply. So how can this be cheaper, have more efficiency, better range for the voltage, weight less and be smaller and smaller than the common transformer and linear regulator supplies? Well, in this video I'll tell you step by step how a switch mode power supply works. We will go through all the components that you can see on these PCBs and explain you why we need each one and by that you will learn the process of a switch supply. So guys make sure that you subscribe and activate the notification bell. And also consider supporting me on Patreon. So let's get started. This episode is sponsored by the PCB manufacturer company GLC PCB. Their main services are the 2 layer PCBs for only $2. Also 4 and 6 layer PCBs, the SMT assembly process where you will get the PCBs with all the components already soldered in place and also the SMT stencil for soldering SMT components with solder paste. The quality of the PCBs is amazing, I use their services all the time and always get good results. For only $2 you have 5 PCBs of any color that you want. So go to glcpcb.com, upload the Gerbil files of your design and order the PCBs in just a couple of minutes. What's up my friends, welcome back. This is a so called linear power supply. In order to understand why the switch supplies are better, we need to know what is wrong with the linear supplies. I guess that you already know, but the linear power supply uses a transformer to lower the voltage from let's say 230 volts AC to something like 20 volts. Then we use a full bridge rectifier to get DC voltage. And finally we apply a simple filter made with a capacitor. It's also quite common to add a linear voltage regulator at this output, so we could get very stable values for let's say 5 volts, 12 volts, 24 and so on. We do that because the transformer ratio is not always perfect and the high voltage input is not always the same value and 100% stable. So what is wrong with this setup? Well, it has a lot of power losses, weights too much and is expensive and for high loads is not a good option. A part of the power is lost on the transformer and even more power is lost on the regulator because as you all know linear regulators are not that efficient and usually they lose power in the form of heat. So first of all, these transformers work at low frequency such as 50 or 60 Hz because that's the frequency we have on our home outlets. And remember that the coil impedance is proportional to the frequency and the self-induction coefficient. So 50 or 60 Hz is a very low frequency. So if the frequency is low, the self-induction coefficient must be high. To achieve high values of self-induction coefficients, we need to use metal cores, which are very heavy. And at the same time, we must create the winding with a high number of loops. So more weight together with more loops, so more copper, will result into a heavy, big and more expensive transformer. And even more, if you need to supply high loads, the copper winding of the transformer must be a lot thicker, obviously, in order to be able to handle high current. 
so that will make the transformer even bigger, heavier and cost a lot more. But on the other side, switch power supplies will work at very high frequencies, higher than 20 kHz. Even more, this can work with square signals. Higher frequency square signals will let us work with much smaller transformers, which can weight a lot less. We use the so-called pulse transformers, which usually will have a core made out of ferrite, to reduce the losses due to eddy currents. We achieve the high frequency square signals with the use of power MOSFET transistors. This work in commutation mode, so we reduce the dissipated power. That's because a MOSFET will dissipate small power when in saturation or cutoff mode. It only dissipates a lot of power when we switch from saturation to cutoff or from cutoff to saturation. So that's how we can get an efficiency a lot higher than linear power supplies. Less weight using small transformers and a lot more power, because the output can now have thicker copper wires, that don't have to be that long. With a thick copper wire we can regulate the output and also have a decent current value. But this will come at a cost, because the circuit of these supplies is a lot more complex. So let's study the schematic of a basic switch mode power supply. These supplies would usually have 5 parts, as you can see here from A to E. A is the main input protection and filter. B is the full bridge rectifier, together with the primary filter of the supply. The C part are the switching transistors, and usually we use two, but sometimes it's just one. Part D is the transformer, which this time is a lot smaller than a linear power supply. Together with this transformer we have the second rectifier's diodes. And finally part E is the output filter coil and capacitors and also the feedback. Now let's talk about each part separately, starting with block A. So here as you can see, usually we have a safety fuse. All these supplies have some sort of safety fuse at the input, so if there is a short circuit, overcurrent and so on, the fuse will blow up and protect the circuit. Ok, so then we have the input filter, which is called EMC filter, which stands for electromagnetic compatibility. This filter is made up of some high voltage capacitors and the 1 to 1 ratio choke. This component, this choke, is important for removing the high frequency noise. The high voltage input signal from our homes usually simulates a perfect sinusoidal wave. But this signal is not perfect nor clean. It comes with a lot of high frequency interferences. So once we pass through this EMC filter, the sine wave should be a lot cleaner, without the high frequency noise. So that's how this first block works. Ok, so block B was the rectifier and the primary filter. Sometimes the supply could have 4 diodes in a bridge configuration, as you can see here on this supply. But other supplies might have just one integrate component, that already has all 4 diodes inside, one like this one here. So this component, as any other full bridge rectifier, will rectify the signal, so only the positive side of the wave will pass. So then we store this positive voltage inside of these high voltage capacitors. So now this will be DC voltage. Here in Europe this input is usually 230 volts AC, and the output from this filter is usually 320 volts DC. So just to get this clear, the input signal is something like this. It has both the positive and the negative sides, so this is AC of 230 volts. The rectifier will create this signal with only positive values. But these are still AC. So if we add the filter capacitor, this capacitor will charge up and smooth the signal. It won't be perfectly flat, but it will be close enough to a DC value. So that's how the second block works. Ok, so the third block are the switching transistors and all the digital part around it. This is a little bit more complicated. To switch the voltage and create the high frequency signal, we use transistors. Sometimes we have just one, as in this case for this supply. But sometimes we have two or more transistors, as we have on this bigger supply. These are usually placed on the exterior of the PCB, so we can easily place this aluminum plate and connect them to the metal case, and use that as a heat dissipator. The gate of this component is controlled by the PWM controller, which is this IC here. On the smaller power supply we have a different controller, 
and any other supply might have a different one. Ok, so for now, the primary filter will give us some sort of DC voltage of high value, around 320 volts for Europe. So now we connect this to the MOSFETs and using high voltage frequency signal at the gate, we create the high frequency signal at the output of the transistors. So the square signals will be connected to the transformer coil. And as we will see later, due to this fast switching, the coil will charge and discharge. And as we have seen in the boost and back converters tutorials, that will also create negative pulses. So this will actually result into an alternating signal once again but this time of a little bit lower voltage, a squared shape and way higher frequency. So that's what the third block does. The fourth block is the transformer and the rectifier diodes. This here might look as some transistors, but these are actually power shot key rectifiers. Some supplies of low power might do this job with only one diode. We don't need more than that. As you can see this one here has only one component. And this is once again a double shot key diode. So now with these components, the fast square pulses from the transformer are also rectified, but this time we are using a half bridge rectifier. Ok, so remember that the signals from the transformers were something like this, alternating between positive and negative values because the coil of the transformer will charge and discharge at high speeds. But now with the shot key half bridge rectifier, we get rid of the negative pulses. So now we only have positive. But this time this positive voltage is variable and controlled with the PWM signal applied to the MOSFETs. So that's what we do on the fourth block. So finally we have the secondary filter, which is made up of a coil and some low value capacitors. This can be low value because now we are working at higher frequencies. So by this formula here, the higher is the frequency, the lower could be the capacitor value. So the coil together with the capacitors will create an LC filter and smooth the output to the required DC value. Ok, so remember that from the last part we were left only with the positive square signals that were still alternating. So now if you want DC, we connect this filter at the output. So once again these capacitors will charge up and discharge, but since the signal is fast enough, there is no time to fully discharge, so we get a more or less steady DC voltage. There is still a ripple at the output of a few millivolts, but for some appliances that is good enough. Ok, so now finally if you want a steady output, there must be a feedback from the output to the PWM driver. For that feedback we usually use an optocoupler, as this component here on the PCB. Because you see, for safety, we must separate the primary side of high voltage from the secondary side of low voltage. So the transformer is already doing that. But now if you want to connect the feedback from the low voltage output back to the controller driver which is controlling the high voltage MOSFETs, we need to still keep the insulation. So these components are using light to send the signals instead of electricity, so now we are insulated. The feedback job is to always keep the steady voltage at the output. If you want 12 volts at the output for example, and there are some unwanted ripples at the input signal, the output might increase or decrease and you don't want that. So the feedback will tell the controller if the voltage is too high or too low and the driver will adapt the PWM signal. By lowering or increasing the duty cycle of the signal as we have seen in the flyback converter tutorial, we can change the output value in order to have always the voltage that we want. Some supplies could also have a current feedback for safety using a shunt resistor. So if the supply gives more current that it could handle, the feedback will inform that to the driver and once again this driver will lower its signal in order to keep the limit of the current value. So let's see the entire process once again but all together. Ok, so the first block will receive the alternating high voltage and protect the circuit with a fuse. And then using the EMC filter we get rid of the high frequency noise and get a clean sine wave. Then we pass this signal to the full bridge rectifier and get the signal rectified with only positive waves. To create more or less a DC voltage, we add a filter with some big capacitors. So now this will charge up and create the high voltage DC. Then the controller together with the MOSFETs will chop up this high voltage DC into fast pulses of DC. These pulses when applied to the transformer coil will start creating an alternating signal once again, 
because the code will charge and discharge. Then we apply the signal to the second half bridge rectifier and once again we get only the positive voltage. We can change the value of this voltage with the PWM signal from the controller. And finally we filter this with the coil and the capacitor and we get our lower and steady DC voltage output. The feedback will always inform the value to the controller in order to keep always the same voltage that we want. Now different supplies might have some different components. As you can see here this is also a switch supply but it has less components. The big one has a second smaller transformer that is probably used to supply the digital part with under 40 volts. Since the digital part is already insulated using the small transformer, there is no need for optocouplers for the feedback. Because as you can see this bigger PCB doesn't have any optocouplers on it, or at least I can see any. So guys that's how a basic switch mode power supply works, and these were all the basic blocks it could have. Some more performance supplies might have even more blocks for the power factor correction and so on. PC power supplies like this one here usually have multiple value outputs and more feedback options for safety features. So guys I hope that you have learned something new and that you like this video. If so give it a like and also consider subscribing and activating the notification bell. Consider supporting me on Patreon. Thanks again and see you later guys.